Okay, I think we can all go home now. <laughs> that was very beautiful. I apologize. We are trying to deal with some technical issues. For some reason, the live stream sound wasn't working. Tina is uh, trying to make all that happen and uh, get them going again. So in the meantime, we're just going to go ahead and continue, and hopefully they will be able to uh, be joining us again uh, very shortly. We're glad to have you here on this first Sunday of Lent, and uh, we are going to be doing something a little bit different, and I want to draw your attention to the wall over here. This, if you were here last year and we did the teachings around the Apostles' Creed, we put the creed up on the wall. Well, we're doing the same thing here with the Lord's Prayer. And so this week we have our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I'm encouraging you to create your own prayer walls at home each week as we go through the Lord's Prayer and to help share what you're doing Take a picture of your wall and send it to office at mountmoriahumc.org. And then in subsequent weeks, we will show a montage of the different prayer walls that you are doing at home. And this will be a way for us to try to create some connection, especially with our friends that aren't able to be with us in person. They're able to share what they're doing. You're able to see what they're doing. You're able to share what you're doing. And this is a way to help us draw one another together. So I hope that you will do that. And you can make it look however you want it to look. Some of you are highly creative. Some of you wouldn't know creativity if it hits you on the head. <laughs> but you know what? You can still be creative anyway. Even if it's just block letters even if it's stick figures, it doesn't really matter. The idea is to live into this prayer in some form, in some fashion. So we invite you to do that. But now you can't color, but you can sing. So I'm going to invite you to sing with us and stand as you're able as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy. seated. 
Good morning, church family. Today, we are starting a new series on prayer. And you know, that got me thinking about there are so many different ways that people pray. You know, when someone says, would you pray with me? Most people will bow their heads and they'll, they'll clasp their hands or they'll do like this. But that's not the only way people pray. Some people will pray by kneeling on the ground. Other people will stand up and raise their hands to the sky. And some people will have one hand on their heart and other people will cover their heads and some will take off their, their hats. And I'm sure the disciples also had this. They, they saw so many different ways of praying and they wanted to be sure they were doing it the right way. And who better to ask than Jesus? So the, the disciples go to Jesus and they say, Rabbi, teacher, teach us the right way to pray. And you know, Jesus doesn't tell them that they need to have their hands raised or clasped or covered or uncovered. He was more concerned with the position of their hearts. He told them, don't be like those hypocrites in the temple who stand up and cry out to the Lord because the position of their heart wants the attention of those around them and not of our Father. In Matthew, he, he invites us, he encourages the disciples to pray in secret because the only person we should focus on is Jesus. So honestly, it doesn't matter if you want to pray like this or standing up or sitting down. It really doesn't matter as long as the position of your heart is focused on Jesus. So today we're going to pray and I invite you to repeat after me and get into whatever position will allow you to focus on God. Would you pray with me? Dear God, Dear, Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus. Thank, thank you that Jesus taught us how to pray. Taught, taught us how to pray. pray. Help our the position of our hearts. Help the position of our hearts to be focused solely. To be focused solely on you. On you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Thank you, Doug. Now, normally, we are used to me doing the prayer concerns and then praying together, but today we're going to dive straight into the message. We are starting a new series on the Lord's Prayer, Lord, Teach Us to Pray, and it just simply made sense to me for us to pray the Lord's Prayer together after the message so that what we are learning together can be immediately applied. So today we are looking at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to continue through the next several weeks to unpack it phrase by phrase. So our scripture this morning comes to us from two sources. First, Luke 11, verse 1, and then Matthew 6, verses 5 through 9. Hear now these words. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, and when you do pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Would you pray with me? The spirit of the living God fall fresh on us this morning so that we will know what prayer is and why we pray certain ways. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, you hear me say some form of Spirit of the Living God prayer at the beginning of of every message, and and that's not just simply a transitory thing to get me from there to here. It's an actual, real, bona fide prayer inviting the Holy Spirit to come in and be with us. And if we don't foot prayer as the foundation of what we do, then everything that we do is not going to be as good as it could be with the Holy Spirit being actively requested to be with us. So have you heard the phrase, everybody does it? A lot of times we hear this often with our teenagers when they want to do something that all their friends are doing and their parents really aren't sure that they want their own kid doing that. So if the kid says, but mom, everybody's wearing holy jeans. And the mom says, I don't care if everybody is doing that. I don't want your knees and your thighs and your bottom to show. And so there's this idea of everybody does it as a justification for why they should get to do it too. But it's not just teenagers, adults are just as likely to use that everybody does it as their own justification. For example, going 74 miles an hour on the freeway when the speed limit is 65. Well, why are we going 74? Well, there's two reasons. One, everybody does it. And then secondly, if we don't do it, they're going to run us over. Or at least we feel that way. But did you also know that everybody does it can be used as just a common behavior within a culture or a community? It's not necessarily something that is wrong. So, for example, everybody, I'll use that loosely, puts up a Christmas tree after Thanksgiving. Is there anybody in the room who does not put up a Christmas tree after Thanksgiving? I don't see any hands raised. Oh, Doug. There's always the exception. But everybody will do certain things, and and that just becomes a part of our culture. And it's 
true even for the idea of prayer. Everybody prays. Even atheists and agnostics have been known to pray even when they have no clue who they're praying to. They will do it anyway. So prayer is one of these things that that is a part of our our human condition. I think this is something that, that God has instilled in us, but even though God's done that, there's a lot of confusion about prayer. In her kids' moment, Natalie talked a little bit about that. You know, we we have questions about what is the right way to pray as if there is a one right way. But I'm convinced that there isn't any one right way. It's not that you must fold your hands together. You must bow your head and close your eyes. The reason we do that is about getting ourselves in the right place by centering us and eliminating the distractions around us, that is why this is a good expression for prayer. So when Jesus is giving us his instructions for how to pray, he's helping to encourage us to exhibit and express ourselves in the right ways to be able to connect with God. But even if we acknowledge all that, sometimes we are still uncomfortable with prayer. Especially if we're being asked to pray out loud in front of other people. Is that, a, is that a common thing? Are there anybody saying, yeah, that's me? I know it's my wife because she's told me multiple times. I had a good friend at a, at a previous church that for years she just flat out refused to pray out loud in front of other people. And, and I kept encouraging her. I kept saying, you know, it's just talking to Jesus. You don't need to worry about all those other people that are around you. Whether that's one person or 300 people, it doesn't matter. Just focus on God. And then one year she helped lead the vacation Bible school and she prayed out loud with all of the other teachers and she came back to me and she said, I don't like it, but I can do it. <laughs> well, during Lent, we are going to dive deep into this idea of prayer, why pray and how to pray using the Lord's Prayer. And the goal is for you to not only better to understand prayer, but for you to better experience prayer and as a result, have a deeper and more intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father. And that is what I hope that we can experience together as the people of God during this season of Lent. But why the Lord's Prayer? What is it about this specific prayer? Well, first of all, there are approximately 2 billion Christians in the world today. And of those 2 billion, approximately half of them are praying the Lord's Prayer every Sunday in worship. So this is a prayer that is familiar to us. Many of us have this prayer memorized, or at least almost memorized. So all we need to do is just see maybe one word in the phrase, and then all the rest of it will come to us. So it's, it's something that's familiar, and that's a good thing, but it's also kind of a not as good thing, because the, the thing that can happen to us is when it's too familiar, it becomes nothing more than rote. Our Father, the Father, the Father, the Father, the Father, the Father, Amen. So we need to slow ourselves down and really look at this prayer. Because this is the prayer that Jesus used as his model prayer. In fact, it's a little bit ironic that we call this the Lord's Prayer. Because this really isn't the prayer that Jesus prayed himself. This is the prayer Jesus offered us as an example. Here's how to pray. So we really should be calling it the disciples' prayer, because this should be all of us, our prayer. Have any of you ever eaten in a fine dining establishment? A number of years ago, Deborah and I had the opportunity to go on a Disney cruise. And the ship that we were on is the Disney Dream. And on the Dream, there is a restaurant called Remy's. Now, Remy is a character from Ratatouille, the um, movie, about a rat who wants to become a gourmet chef. Now, I'm not going to get into whether rats and fine food should ever go together or not. 
but Remy's was the name of this fine dining establishment. And on our last night of the cruise, Deborah and I went and we enjoyed that. Now, when you go to a fine dining place, it's not a quick thing. They give you different courses, and each course has its own specific theme, and we even bought the wine that was paired to go with it, and at Remy's restaurant, the night that we were there, the chef had put together two different menus. There was this menu, and there was this menu. Deborah and I looked at each other and said, okay, you get one, I'll get the other, and we'll share. <laughs> and so, we began to enjoy this meal. The first course came out, and it was beautifully presented. It wasn't big. It wasn't one of these, you know, but the flavors were amazing. And, and all of this just, just created this, this incredible experience. And then the next course came and then the next course. And by the time we were done, it was like three hours later. But I enjoyed every single moment of that experience. It was probably one of the finest culinary experiences in my life. And by the way, one of the most expensive. Compare that to running through the drive through at Burger King. Now, you can get a Whopper. You can even get a double Whopper with cheese. I mean, you can get a really fulfilling, at least from a caloric standpoint, meal from Burger King. But if you have the choice between a regular diet of BK or a regular diet of Remy... Which would you rather have? For me, I'd rather lean more towards the Remy. Well, my friends, the Lord's Prayer can either be experienced as a, a BK meal or it can be experienced as a fine dining experience. It all depends on how we approach it and how we engage. So we're going to treat the Lord's Prayer like a Remy meal. Savor each portion of the prayer. And so we begin with our Father. Now, right away, we have to stop because Jesus didn't say, my Father. This is how you should pray, my Father who art in heaven. It's our Father. Now, that's really strange because right before he gives them this phrase as the way to begin a prayer, what did Jesus instruct them to do in where to pray? He said to go into your private place. So if Jesus is telling us to go into our private place, doesn't that seem to mean that he would have us do this by ourselves, my Father who art in heaven? But even when we are in our private place, he is still our Father in a collective sense because God is not exclusive. God is open and available to everyone. Every flavor of the Christian religion, we can say our Father. Whether you're Methodist, Baptist, Roman Catholic, Episcopalian, the list goes on. There's like 7,500 different denominations of Christianity recognized in the United States of America. And that doesn't even count the rest of the world. But he's our Father, irrespective of where we start in our faith. But even for people who aren't Christians, he is still their father too. Because God desires all the world to come to him. God doesn't say, well, if you're a Muslim, I don't want you. If you're a Buddhist, I don't want you. No, Jesus says God wants all to experience God. And so it's our father in an exclusive, inclusive basis. All of us can experience God's love, God's grace, and God's transforming work in our lives. But he also says, our Father. Now, in all of the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, they never prayed to God as Father. God was always referred to with a different name. Elohim is a very common way of, of addressing God. And, and Elohim means the, the Godhead, kind of all of the aspects of divinity. In Hebrew, it's even a plural word, even though they know God is one. 
Then there was the, the name that Moses learned from God when he was at the burning bush and, and Moses said, what shall I tell them? Who shall I tell them has come? And God said, I am that I am. And that is the yod heh vav heh in the Hebrew language. And that's pronounced Yahweh or Jehovah. But often when the Hebrews prayed because they were careful about using God's name, they would often not refer to any of these specific names. They would just say, King of the universe. But it was never Father. So Jesus radically changes things when he says, when you pray, you should pray, Our Father. Now, the word that Jesus actually used is Abba. That's an Aramaic word that can be translated as father or really more informally as dad or daddy. Now, we have to be careful when we, when we think about that because the temptation can be to take that familiarity of dad or daddy and, and make it too familiar. But for Jesus, he's saying, you can, you can refer to God as my dad, my, my heavenly dad, because He's not trying to diminish the authority of God. The relationship is still there, but it's an intimate relationship. Now, I don't call my own father, father. I call him dad. My own kids, they, they call me daddy. They still respect me, and I still respect my dad, but, but I don't say, Father Ron, may I have a word with thee, please? You know, we, we just, hey, Dad, how's it going? What are you doing? And so I think Jesus is trying to get us to understand that we can experience God closely, not just at a distance, but yet we shouldn't let this devolve to just the big guy in the sky kind of an approach to God. But when people hear that Jesus says, calling him Father, there's some, some concerns that can come out of that, especially for 20th and 21st century mentality. So I want to real briefly just touch on some of these concerns. One concern is, does this mean that God is male? Does calling God Father mean that, that he's only male? And the answer to that is no. God is beyond Gender. He's neither male nor female. Both characteristics of the masculine and the feminine are in God and given to us. Genesis says, for God created them male and female in his image. So it's not that men have something special that women don't or vice versa. It means that together we are part of God. And so God as Father is trying to help us to understand the relationship that we can have with God, not to describe a gender. Another common concern about God as Father is, well, isn't Father just a reflection of the patristic society that Jesus grew up in? Now, patristic means male-dominated. comes from the Latin patri. Patristic being the men are in charge. And yes, Jesus grew up in a society where the women were not considered as equal to men, but that's not why Jesus is using this phrase either. Patristic societies are a misapplication and a misappropriation of Scripture. Anybody who tries to use the Bible to say that men are up here and women are down there, they're not reading their Bibles carefully enough. God clearly defined the human relationship intending it to be equal. The Apostle Paul understood it to be equal. He recognized the women in leadership in the church as much as he did the men. It's only when our society then begins to try to bend the Scripture into their will that we get into this men versus women and putting women into a lesser place. So even as gender causes us to have physically, physiologically different bodies and experiences, that doesn't make one better than the other. Or a third concern about God is, I have a problem with God as father because my father, my earthly human father, was this, was abusive, was absent, was hurting me, was doing all kinds of whatever 
those negative adjectives could be. And because of their negative experience with their human father, they have difficulty experiencing God as father. They, they want to reject that, that whole concept. I understand that. But here's the truth that I hope that we can hear if we come out of that environment. Your human father is not a reflection of your heavenly father. But rather, your heavenly father is meant to be a pattern and example for what a human father is supposed to be. So if someone had less than a good experience with their earthly father, it's their heavenly father that's going to help them heal from that best. Jesus' disciples one point said, show us the father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus gave them a funny look and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so if we look at Jesus, we see he is the one who's giving us the best example of the attributes of our Heavenly Father. Look to him and you will see what real dads are supposed to be. The next phrase is, who art in heaven. Now, heaven is a great word. When, when we look at this, though, however, we're wondering, okay, is this a geographic reference? I mean, I don't say, my dad who lives in Menard, Texas. I just say, hey, dad. No, the, the idea of who art in heaven is really a statement about the transcendence of God. I'm sure you've all heard the tune, he's got the whole world in his hands. Now I've given you an earworm. You're going to hear this all the rest of the week. <laughs> well, that's true. God has the whole world in his hands, but it's, it's much more than just the world. Did any of you follow the progress of the Perseverance probe that NASA landed on Mars this week? I mean, this probe went all the way from the Earth to Mars. It launched on July the 30th, 2020. So more than six months and 33 million miles later, it lands on Mars. But you know what? God was already there, too. God is not just the God of humanity, just the earth, just the solar system. God is the God of the heavens, of everything that we can see. Our visible universe is about 93 billion miles in diameter. Now, by visible, what I mean is using our instruments, we're able to measure and identify objects in the universe, other galaxies that are 93 billion miles away from us. That's a long way. But some scientists are saying that the non observable universe, that which we can theorize, may be as many as 7 trillion light years. In diameter. Now, I, I can't get my brain around seven trillion. It doesn't make sense to me in terms of distance, doesn't make sense to me in terms of money. But seven trillion, and God is bigger and able to put his whole hands around even that. So God is transcendent in, in all of the heavens. But here's the funny thing. The word that is used for heaven can be translated to mean everything up, out, and beyond us. But it also can be used to describe the air that we breathe. And so our Father who art in heaven is also about the imminence of God. That God is right here among us with us, as close as the air that you breathe. So breathe in. You've just brought in God. God is that close. God can be even within us in the air that we breathe. God out there. God right here. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And I heard a story about a, a kid who got to this point in the prayer, and, and what he said was, hollered, be my name. I guess because every time he heard his name, his mama was hollering at him. 
But that's not really what we're trying to do. We're not hollering his name. We're hallowing his name. And hallow is an antique word. We don't use it much anymore. That means to make holy. So this phrase is an acknowledgement that God's name is a holy name. Well, in order to understand what that means, we have to define holy. So here's what holy means. Holy means to be set apart, to be not the normal, to be unusual, and not the everyday. When I was growing up, my mom had a special set of dishes that we used only on Christmas Eve. They were these beautiful red translucent plates, and the only time they came out was Christmas Eve, and so I always looked forward to to Christmas Eve and getting to eat our Christmas Eve dinner on those special plates, so much so that that I hoped that someday I would get them. No, my brother did. (laughs) But it doesn't make them less holy. They were still set apart from the, the normal use, and that should be a way for us to understand that God's name is not something to just be used anyway. It's a sign of reverence to God. In fact, the Jews take this so seriously that even today, many Jews, when they talk about God, they will, in typewritten form, they will do G blank D, trying to treat the name of God as holy, not ordinary. But, you know, nowadays most people use God's name all the time. Ask your student, your your child, your grandchild, what does OMG mean? You'll see people chatting OMG all the time, or they'll use OMG as comments in social media. Well, OMG is, oh my God! And they're not talking to the Lord. They're expressing, oh, really? Surprise, amazement, bewilderment. Oh, my God, he said that to you? It's not talking about God at all. It's it's taking God's name and treating it as common and not special. The opposite of holy is profane, and so profanity is using God's name in a way that it was never intended to be used. We need to stop with the OMGs. OMG, let's stop it. God, help us to use your name well and right and set apart. Another misuse of God's name is when people do things in God's name, but the things that they do are not a reflection of God's character. Slavery. That's an example of using God's name in vain. I know there's slavery in the Bible, but if you read your Bible carefully, God never says slavery is a good thing. It's recognized as being a thing, and Jesus is to free us from our slavery. The subordination of women, we've already talked about this, that that is a misrepresentation of God's name. All the clergy sexual abuse scandals, pastors who have taken advantage of the people that are under their care and have used them for their own purposes, that is an abuse, a profanation of God's name. So one level of the meaning of hallowed be thy name is that God's name is a reflection of God's character. That is to be our reminder. So we should treat God's name with respect because God is one to be respected. A second level of meaning is it's actually a request to make God's name great. In other words, it is to be God. Holy is to be set apart. It's also to be revered and honored and made great. Who was the greatest president ever of the United States? Well, it's a debate, either George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. Well, George Washington is on the $1 bill. If he's such a great president, why isn't he on a bigger denomination of bill? I mean, there used to be a $1,000 bill. Why isn't Washington on the $1,000 bill? Well, because there wasn't as great of a circulation. 
We want a George Washington's portrait on every dollar that we could put it on. And as of 2019, there are 12.7 billion $1 bills, however many billions I just said, of Georges in the world. Do you know how many $1,000 bills are around these days? About 15 because they were recalled by the U.S. Treasury in 1969, and Grover Cleveland was the last president to show up on a $1,000 bill. Now, how many of you are excited about Grover Cleveland and making his name great? So the greater circulation is the greater experience of something being great. So hallowed be your name means that we want to put God's name into circulation. Now, it's kind of interesting. We want to not treat God's name as common and every day on the one hand, but we want God's name to be out there and known in as positive a manner as it can. And the way that happens is through you and through me. It's through our words and our actions. So when we say, hallowed be thy name, we are saying, God, let me help make your name great. Well, the only way that we can do that is to not focus so much on our names, on our reputation. We have to get over ourselves. Now, maybe you're different, but for me, Maybe part of the the standing up here and and talking to you about God every week is because I want the attention. I want people to pay attention to to what I say and how I say in a way to try to help you better understand and experience God. So I face that temptation of make Carrie great. No! I got to get out of that mind of thinking. It's making God's name great. It's not about me, or it shouldn't be about me. Did Jesus say this? Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and put you on a pedestal. No, I don't think that's what Jesus said. He said, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's Matthew 5, 16. So to wrap this up, to put this all together, acknowledging God as Father is to help us understand how much God loves us. And our acknowledges that we are in God's care together, that there's no one excluded. In heaven helps us to understand that God holds together the entire universe at the same time that he is as close as the very air that we breathe. Hallow is an action, something that we do or we fail to do by our actions, by our conversations, and by our attitudes. You might say that the opening of this prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is to put us into the Goldilocks zone. You know what the Goldilocks zone is? It's it's not too far, thinking of God as being some kind of a stranger or a distant, uninterested party. It's not too close thinking that God is your buddy or your genie or any other kind of a wish maker, Santa Claus, but to be just right, that he is your honored creator and provider. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. So with that in mind, my friends, I'm going to invite you to join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer, together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stay tuned as we seek to learn the power of the other phrases there. I have several prayer requests that we want to lift up this morning. First of all, for for Bonnie Lawson, she uh, wants us to continue to pray for Barb Nelson. Barb is related to their 
kids as an in-law. And then I also learned this morning that Jerry had an incident with a horse and tore his ACL. So we want to pray for, for Jerry and healing for that. Renee Spaulding has given us an update on her dad. She said he is improving, but her sister is still having some breathing issues, so to, to keep her in prayer. Continue to pray for Sylvia Daniel as her, her, her blood, blood, blood levels and, and other vital statistics are, are being monitored to, to make sure she's doing well. Alice Hamilton has reported that her daughter's son-in-law is safe. You might remember that a couple of weeks ago he may have been missing, and so they were concerned, and he's now doing just fine. And then we have a couple of anniversaries to celebrate. We have some flowers on the altar this morning in celebration of Marsha and Rick Murphy. So Marsha is over there, and we're praying for you and for Rick. And also, this is Bill and Mary Davis's anniversary, and so we celebrate that with you as well. Congratulations to you all. I want to thank all of you for your continued support of the ministries of Mount Moriah Church, and I invite you to stand as we sing the doxology. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above ye heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy God. pray that you will bless these gifts and bless the givers. Lord, help us to make your name great by offering ourselves to you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing together our closing song. God, as forth in fields of conquest, my tent shall be our home. Through days of preparation, my grace has made us strong. And now, O King Eternal, we lift our battle song. shall cease, and holiness and whisper the sweet amen of peace, for not with swords and clashing, nor rolling stirring drops, for with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly King. Lifted o'er us, we journey in its light. The crown awaits the conquest. We honor God alight. Would you be seated for just a moment? Give you some ways that you can help to make God's name great this week. First of all, if you are a youth or you know a youth between the 6th and 12th grade, there is a special game night virtually happening this evening. And if you want the Zoom link, you can email Natalie at family.ministries at mountmoriahumc.org. And that is something that's open to anybody 6th through 12th grade. That is happening at 7.30 p.m. this evening. Uh, we're continuing to focus on prayer, the Lord's Prayer. I'd mentioned the prayer wall. Go home and make a prayer and then send us your pictures. The United Methodist Women are meeting March 1st. That's a week from tomorrow in the parlor. And uh, there's information about that in your worship guide that you can certainly uh, pay attention to. 
As you know, we are doing altar flowers, so if there is someone that you want to uh, honor or there's an event that you want to celebrate, that is available to you. And mark your calendars for June Vacation Bible School. We're already looking for folks who'd be willing to help make this happen. So if you are interested in being a VBS volunteer, contact Natalie. Her phone number and the email is on the, the worship guide. You can also find her on the church website. My friends, we continue to learn what normal looks like in this ongoing COVID experience. And I appreciate how adaptable and flexible we have become through all this. Let's don't give up. Let's keep going. Because even COVID, we can use to hallow God's name. Go forth to pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Amen.